Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the 10th District Virtual Town Hall. Tonight, you will be hearing from your state legislators, Senator Ron Mazal, Representative Dave Paul, and Representative Greg Gilday. At this event, we are talking about what happened during the 2021 legislative session that just wrapped up last month. Your lawmakers are going to answer questions submitted to us in advance, and later in the event, you'll be able to submit some questions to us in the chat. Tonight, we are also joined by Mount Vernon Mayor Jill Boudreau, who will be moderating the event. Mayor Boudreau has been serving as mayor since 2012, and she is committed to a municipal government that is efficient, adaptable, and dignified. And she has significantly raised the level of community engagement in the city of Mount Vernon. As a full-time city administrator, she is responsible for 10 departments providing services like public safety, public works, community development, parks, and library. She's developed strong communication skills over time, adapting to frequent relocations and jobs as a military spouse, as a community service officer with the Mount Vernon Police Department, and as a volunteer mediator. I will now turn it over to the mayor to get us started. Thank you so much for the introduction and welcome to our entire audience tonight. I just want to give a big thank you in advance to our 10th legislative district electeds for taking their time for this town hall. And of course, also a huge thank you to the staff that are behind the scenes making all of the things happen for this event. Not every uh, legislator takes time to do this. So again, we're super appreciative to our 10th legislative district electeds. So now each member will have some time to introduce himself and talk a little bit about what was worked on throughout the session. So first up, I'd like to ask Representative Dave Paul to start us off. Representative Paul. Well, thank you so much, Mayor. And, and thank you so much for taking the time in your evening. I know how busy you are uh, to host our town hall this evening, to moderate our town hall. Um, and I'd like to thank Maisie and Eric and Nick. Uh, those are our, our legislative assistants and our communication staff uh, across both of the caucuses, the three caucuses, have worked really hard to put this event together. I, I just can't thank them enough for doing this. Um, so they're working a long day. Uh, folks are working 10, 12 hours today. Uh, so hi folks, I'm Dave Paul. My family and I live in Oak Harbor and, and when I'm not in the legislature, I also work at Skagit Valley College where I'm a director of community relations and I teach American government and really focus this session on, on making sure that we are gonna support education both during and after the pandemic and helping to address learning loss and help get our families and our communities back to work. Um, I'm fortunate to serve on the College and Workforce Development Committee in the Community and Economic Development Committee and the Transportation Committee. All those really align, I think, with important work in our, in our district. And please this year, we made a lot of progress on broadband, uh, which I'm sure we'll talk about during the, uh, during the town hall this evening. Um, working to make sure that we've got a healthy ferry fleet. Uh, and really proud of a bill that I co-sponsored with Representative Matt Banky. It's a bipartisan bill uh, to help increase manufacturing across all of all corners of our state and to make sure that more women and minority businesses have the opportunity to, to work in the, in the manufacturing sector. Um, and last thing I'll touch on before I turn it over to Representative Gilday, uh, really have proud of the work we've done on promoting dual credit. And that, that's opportunities for folks to earn college credit while they're still in high school. Some of that work was done last session and is now just paying off where we, uh, one of the bills I sponsored the summer running start program that's kicking off this summer. We have a textbook program um, and also working across the aisle to help making sure that our skill centers like the Dave Call Center in Mount Vernon are getting ad adequate and uh, good funding. Um, so that's some of the things we're working on. I want to turn it over to my seatmate, Representative Greg Gilday. Thank you, Dave. There's a Dave Paul Center in Mount Vernon. Dave Paul. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Just want to make sure I heard that right. Um, so yeah, I want to uh, thank Mayor Pedro for taking the time to uh, moderate this tonight. Thank you to all the people who have come to uh, listen. I know that here in Stanwood, at least, we have a little bit of blue sky out there. So it's nice that you're taking some time out of your evening to come listen to us. Uh, thank you to our LAs. Uh, without all their work, we wouldn't be able to do this. And thank you to my seatmates. Uh, I don't know if, if all of you know that we are one of four districts in the state that actually have a split uh, 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 group going down to Olympia, and it's really nice to, to have 
uh, seatmates that uh, we can chat with and I can ask questions on and, and we can work together to get things done. So uh, my name's, uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Greg Gilday. I live on Camino with my family, uh, my wife Megan and two boys. I'm third generation here in this area. Uh, when I'm not in session, I am also a practicing attorney and, uh, and a real estate broker. I uh, serve on the uh, board of a local title and escrow company. This was my first session as your representative. And uh, I, I won't lie to you, it was, it was tough. Uh, for those of you who don't know, it was all virtual. So it was done, uh, we had one afternoon down there and then the rest of it was done behind uh, multiple computer screens. And for a freshman, that was really difficult because so much of this job is based on relationship building. It's based on those conversations you have after the committee hearings uh, in the wings of the, of the uh, uh, house chambers, uh, you know, talking with people in the hallways, things like that. And, uh, and we didn't have any of that. I mean, I, I, uh, I had one day where I, well, a day and a half where I was trying to set up a five minute phone call. And so it's just, it was, it was a lot more difficult to get things done that way. Uh, silver linings of the virtual session, though, I'd like to look at, at positives. Uh, I got to go home every night, which was nice. Didn't have to go down to uh, Olympia uh, during the week. And the other thing that I like is that at least in the house, it, it forced us to get into the virtual world. Uh, the Senate has been doing virtual testimony for a couple of years to a certain extent, uh, but this really opened it up to allow more people to participate. And I am uh, uh, optimistic that that's going to be something that sticks around even when we're back down in Olympia. Uh, this year, I spent a lot of time listening and learning. Uh, as you can imagine, this is a, it's a steep learning curve down there in Olympia. And, uh, and so I'm just uh, learning as much as I possibly can. I sit on the Capital Budget Committee, uh, as well as the, I'm the Assistant Ranking Member on both the Housing, Human Services, and Veterans Committee, and the Civil Rights and Judiciary Committee. So thank you again for coming tonight. Looking forward to it. And then I'm passing it off to Senator Mazzal. Good evening. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mayor, for taking the time to uh, help us out this evening and to my seatmates and to all the staff that's worked so hard to put this together. Um, we're all learning in a new world here of, of, uh, of Zoom and, and having meetings online and so on and so forth. I, uh, the Senate was a little different than the House this year. There were um, somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 of us on the Senate floor. I spent about three and a half weeks down there. Um, so I, we did get to have some sort of normalcy, although it wasn't really anything like a normal session. Um, so I'm Senator Ron Mazal. I'm a fourth generation farmer here on Whidbey Island um, with my wife, Shelly of 30, almost 36 years, and uh, two of our three daughters who farm <laughs> with us here. Um, I've had a, a 30 years of serving on boards of directors of farmer co-ops and um, fire districts and on county committees and the like. And this was my second session. The uh, I'm a deputy whip of uh, the Republican caucus in the Senate. Um, the, um, I'm also ranking member on health and long-term care, and I spent uh, all, most of my legislation had to do with that. I was co-sponsor of a few others, but uh, uh, most of it had to do with health and long-term care. I also sit on Ways and Means Committee and on the Rules Committee. Um, interesting session. Um, we're uh, in the in the, in the Senate, we're definitely in the minority, 28-21. Uh, if it's a partisan vote, that's where we end up with is the, the 21. Uh, the, uh, uh, we, in health and long-term care, uh, we, we had some uh, rather pertinent legislation when it came to telehealth. Telehealth became inc incredibly important during the pandemic. And though we'd passed a bunch of legislation last year, we had to fine tune it this year. And uh, that and a number of other issues, um, but uh, it was, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that our next session is back to at least some semblance of normal and we can accomplish uh, more easier. So thank you. All right, gentlemen, thank you for the introduction and that overview. So we received lots of different questions, uh, some um, on similar topics. 
So staff boiled it all down to some questions to lead us off from things, uh, questions that were asked previously. So we're gonna move into those areas. So we'll have each member uh, to speak a minute or two on each particular topic. And then once we've completed those discussions, we'll have a chance to take questions from the Zoom chat uh, function. And so feel free to put questions in there if you're uh, watching this live. So we're gonna start out with, uh, let's, let's start it with Representative Paul again, then we'll go to Representative Gilday and Senator Mazal, and then we'll switch it up as we go through the questions. So the first question is about Senate Bill 5044, which is getting a lot of attention in the media. So could you tell us what your thoughts are on approaching issues of equity and inclusion in schools and other institutions? Representative Paul? Thank you, Mayor, I appreciate that. So, you know, clearly we've got a lot of work to do as a society. So, you know, just 50 years ago, we had systems designed to make sure that um, black Americans couldn't vote. Uh, my family and I watched Selma uh, last summer and uh, all kinds of systems set up to make sure that communities of color and, and women did not get to participate fully. And we, we still are working on those issues. So we passed a bill this year to address uh, racism and homeowners covenants. Um, the wealth gap between black Americans and white Americans has not changed at all in my lifetime. We can look at the data on on student discipline, on police stops, we know we have so much work to do. And if we're not gonna talk about these issues, we're not gonna be able to fix them. So, you know, I've participated in this training. Uh, I, I'm in the community college system. You know, it, it can cause, it can be challenging conversations to have about what do we need to do to, to fix um, our work to make sure that everybody gets to participate and everybody has great opportunities in our society. And, and, you know, I only, we didn't have a lot of bills passed this year, fewer bills than the normal. One of the bills we've got passed, mine, that dealt with high school transcripts, I hope makes a small step in that direction that we are not gonna have transcripts withheld uh, for students who might have a discipline block. Um, so I think we've got a lot of work to do. I think this can be a really challenging topic, but I've heard from folks, my colleagues at the college that have not wanted to go through that training and emerged feeling like it was very valuable. Um, and I also know from talking to our employers that our local businesses want folks that can work well with everybody in their community and can practice critical thinking skills. I think this training is wanted by our employers. So those are just some of my thoughts. It's a really, we could spend an hour talking about, about this issue, but uh, I'll turn it over to the next person. Okay, Representative Gilday. Uh, thank you. you. You're right, 5044 is getting a lot of attention. It was a very controversial bill and it was one of, uh, I believe four bills uh, that uh, were very similar, just targeting different, different areas of education. Uh, I voted against them for a couple of reasons. First, uh, I think that this is a this is a requirement that should be handled at the local level. I don't think this should be a a, a mandate from the state level. Uh, for example, in our public schools, uh, the school board, the members of the school board are the, are the closest to the local community who can in, vote to either have this training or not have the training. But they're the ones who are most answerable to their local communities and local schools. So I should think it should be left at local. Uh, second, it what it boils down to is these are essentially critical race theory. And I know that that term is not used in the bill. I think it was purposefully not used in the bill. Uh, but uh, I don't think that's something that should be taught in these taught in public schools. Uh, I don't believe we should be drawing preconceived notions based on, on race or gender. I don't believe that America is inherently evil or racist. Uh, I don't believe that uh, capitalism is inherently evil or racist. Uh, so these things, I, I don't believe that they should be taught in schools. Uh, you know, Representative Paul is correct. We do need to have open and on, honest conversations, uh, but those conversations can't start by separating out individuals based on their race or gender. Uh, it can't devolve into dissenting opinions being shut down as racist just because they're dissenting. Uh, there is racism in our country. 
I, I don't deny that, but not everything is racist. So we don't need to treat everything as if it is racist. Okay, thank you. Senator Mazal. So this has been a, a very interesting topic. And I think that 5044 has been represented as uh, something that it really is not. It is a requirement of the state that it be included in the three days of continuing education of teachers. Um, critical race theory was, was not in the bill. It's not presented. And local school boards have the ability to design or adopt curriculum as they see fit in their districts. There, um, there are issues um, that, that we have seen, uh, for instance, lack funding in school districts from the state level. Um, we haven't um, uh, fully funded lap funding in, in our state budget in our schools like, like we should have learning assistance programs. And learning assistance programs uh, very often fall onto um, minority communities. And, and several of the uh, minority communities that I am working with currently are concerned about equity. Uh, and uh, that is an issue that they're concerned about and they feel that, that it should be a part of the curriculum that teachers have to address in the system. Um, but it, it isn't critical race theory. It's having discussions, having education. It's addressing what are ongoing issues um, when it comes to funding and curriculum and discipline and on and on in our school districts. All right, thank you all for the, for the answers to a, a big question leading it right off. So question number two, we'll start off with Representative Gilday first. How do you feel about the state's budget that was passed by the legislature? Okay, so uh, first I'll point out that there's three main budgets that are passed. There's the operating budget, that's the big one that people generally talk about. There's the capital budget, which is your bricks and mortar budget, it's the, what builds buildings and infrastructure and things of that nature. And then there's a transportation budget, which takes care of the transportation needs. So um, first off, we'll talk about the operating budget. Uh, I did vote against it, and there again were a number of reasons why I voted against it. Uh, while it did do a lot of good things, uh, I think on balance, it was just too big, too much, and it's gonna set us up for a, uh, a bow wave in the years to come for, the, for, for spending. Uh, this increased spending by 13.6%, that's over $7 billion, and that's before you even take into account the $7 billion we still have from the feds uh, from the latest stimulus. Uh, it, uh, the other thing that, or another thing I didn't like about it was that it takes the rainy day fund, which is, uh, a fund that the state has set aside for emergencies and how we keep it for emergencies is it requires a major, or a, sorry, a super majority vote in order to spend those funds. Uh, however, there is a caveat in the law that allows when employment reaches or unemployment reaches a certain level for a certain amount of time, it can be taken out on a simple majority vote. And so what this for an operating budget does is it took the money out of the rainy day fund under that simple majority vote and just put it in a separate fund. They didn't have a use for it quite yet, but it's now in a fund that they can, that the, uh, uh, the other side can uh, get at with uh, just a simple majority vote. And I think that that kind of defeats the purpose of the rainy day fund. Uh, the last thing I didn't like about the budget is that it included the capital gains income tax. Uh, and I think it's very clearly an income tax and it's an unconstitutional tax. Uh, as many of you probably are aware, there's already a couple of lawsuits that are gonna be filed against it. And we'll, we'll have a, the court's determination on that in the next year or two, hopefully. Um, as far as the capital budget, uh, this was a much more bipartisan budget uh, where uh, both sides work together in order to do it. Uh, I did vote for that one. It's a good one. Uh, it invests a lot in broadband, broadband infrastructure, which, uh, uh, which we know is very important in today's world. Uh, it invests a lot in public works assistance account, which uh, gives low interest or grant funds to local uh, municipalities and local governments in order to uh, fund public works projects. And uh, uh, closer to home, it provided over a million dollars for uh, the Boys and Girls Club in Coopville to get a new facility built there. Uh, and facilities upgrades that would be helped. Uh, the transportation budget, that one was a also a bipartisan budget. Uh, and that one was a, a, a tighter budget because the transportation funds were a little bit tighter than the general operating funds. Uh, but this does a lot of good stuff, uh, provides an additional class of state troopers 
and uh, and it provides a lot of money for our ferries. Pro provides over a billion dollars for our ferry system, uh, split over both capital costs and operating costs. So um, overall, I voted for two of the budgets, and I but I did vote against the operating budget. Okay, thank you, Senator Mazal. How do you feel about the state uh, budget? Well, I will agree with Representative Gilday. I don't believe it's sustainable. Um, we had come up with our own budget in the Senate Republican Caucus of $56 billion. Uh, we were uh, going back a year, we were very concerned about what the income was going to be in the state. Um, as it turned out, um, though sales tax um, was down, uh, real estate excise tax, uh, alcohol, cannabis taxes made up for the loss in sales taxes. And so we we proposed in end of February, 1st of March, a, uh, a budget that 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 went up 56 billion. Uh, it fully funded our retirement programs. It uh, did a number of things that we have been kicking the can further down the road. Um, when the uh, majority came forward with their budget of 59.4 billion, I think it was, um, we were we didn't support that, and uh, we were we're just very concerned about the sustainability of, of that kind of budget. There was, you know, over 30 taxes proposed. They passed 20 some. Um, some of them are fees. Some of them are taxes. All of them to increase. Um, we didn't see the need for that. Um, and, and actually, our April income was 266 million above projections. So we continue to bring in more money than we needed to, and none of the new taxes have, have come into, into play yet. Uh, the capital budget was, was generous this year, and it's based on our ability to bond and so on. And uh, I think that by and large, we addressed some issues that had been lagging and that we needed to. And, and one of those, as Rep Gilday mentioned, was, was the um, uh, broadband, which, which we funded heavily in, in both budgets. The transportation budget was a keep the lights on kind of budget because there was not the support to increase gas taxes. Um, that was, they, they wanted to increase gas taxes. Both the House and the Senate had that in their transportation budget, but they could not get a majority to be able to do that. So we passed a transportation budget that addresses what had to be addressed, but nothing else. So I, I voted for one out of the three, I believe. So anyhow. All right, thank you. Representative Paul, thoughts on the budget. Thank you, Mayor. So um, there was a lot of uh, one-time dollars, federal funds in um, this budget, uh, which is one of the reasons it's, well, it's the main reason it's so large. Uh, and I, I was surprised one of the early bills, the COVID relief package, um, House Bill 1368, I was surprised how partisan that was. You know, we talk about the rainy day fund, it, it wasn't just rain, it was pouring um, and in our communities need investment, we need to get people back on their feet. Uh, so you, we've got a plan to get that rainy day fund back up by the end of the four year outlook, uh, which is required by law. Uh, and we we'll look at each one of those um, bills that helps go into the budget carefully. Uh, I, uh, Senator mentioned the different tax or fees. I think the only tax or fee I voted for was the one establishing the 988 system uh, which, you know, as a, in my role as uh, Dean of Students, when I'm helping students that are in crisis, I know how important it is to be able to pick up the phone and talk to somebody uh, directly who can be that mental health expert. Um, and then the proviso that we helped get across to help Island County with youth and mental health uh, is really important. I think in rural communities like ours, uh, we do not have enough resources for uh, mental health and especially for young people. Uh, on the, the capital side, uh, much more bipartisan, but really important projects that help meet our community needs from the Dijewalik uh, Treatment Center that Sandra was all really championed to um, the different projects across our, our district from um, schools and libraries to uh, the Boys and Girls Club that Representative Gilday mentioned. And on the transportation side, really pleased to see uh, more money for ferries because we that is 
a hard sell in many parts of our state, but it's a critical part of our highway uh, system. And I'm really pleased to see an emphasis on maintenance and preservation, uh, which we've talked a lot about in our district, but uh, haven't always been able to get it, um, that emphasis because it's not one of those bright, shiny projects. Um, so I feel like I've talked too much, uh, but that, that, those are my feelings on those three budgets. All right, thank you all for that. And I'll, I'll just make a quick mention. Thank you for your support on our Capital Library project here in Mount Vernon. So we appreciate that. Um, before I ask the next question, I um, just wanted to make mention for those of you that are using the Q&A chat feature in our Zoom uh, Live, just uh, remember that that is all subject to public records. And so when you're typing your questions in, please keep that in mind. And also, um, I believe that they're casting this uh, live Zoom onto a Facebook Live, but those questions aren't being monitored. Um, so I know at the end of this, you'll have an opportunity to contact your representative's offices. So if your question isn't answered, um, there'll be information about that. Okay, moving on to our next question, and this will be led off by Senator Mazal. Uh, talk a bit about your priorities for addressing the problems the COVID pandemic has brought to light, either in how we govern or specific actions the state has taken or should take to address community needs. Well, obviously the last pandemic of this magnitude occurred 100 years ago. And, and to say that we've traveled light years since then is, is an understatement. So um, there's a lot of learnings that we had to do. Um, we, we did work on legislation this year that would actually put into place um, plans. So if this were to happen again, we would immediately be able to move into those plans and adopt things that, were, uh, that we saw as helping us, especially in, when it came to hospitals and, and medical clinics and that kind of thing. I had mentioned telehealth. Um, that turned out to be incredibly important. And uh, the, uh, we, we had to address issues as far as insurance payment and that kind of a thing on, on telehealth. But um, it isn't, uh, it, it, in some parts of our state, it was much more important than in others, but there were a, a lot of medical clinics who, who were utilizing telehealth almost exclusively in the early parts of the pandemic. Uh, we, uh, we had our differences uh, in the legislature as far as um, uh, when it came to renters, when it came to landlords, when it came to small business, but we did see a bunch of that federal money that was distributed uh, both to renters uh, and rental assistance and landlords as well, um, and, and to small businesses. Uh, there's, there's no doubt that all of us are looking forward to getting back to normal again. Uh, back to at least some semblance of normal, have our restaurants be able to we had great fear as to how many restaurants might close at this point in time. It seems as though it's less than what we had feared, but uh, we need to we need to get businesses back on their feet. And uh, we tried through legislation and programs to to see that that we were doing that. Um, going forward, um, we're never going to get it perfect, but I think that we we've put some legislation in place and and some programs in place that would allow us to react quicker and and with. Um, more uh, support for those. Um, but realizing the legislature was largely left out of a lot of the decision making because of the fact that the governor had an emergency declaration. So the legislature did not have much input when it came to the COVID programs that were enacted. Thank you. Okay, Representative Paul, uh, priorities for addressing problems the COVID pandemic brought to light. Thank you, Mayor. So uh, piggyback on some of the things the Senator said. So I, I think um, we learned the importance of making sure we could have remote testimony, uh, which we've been um, championing for a number of years, uh, but also allowing for uh, governments to have um, the ability to have legal votes online, um, which I think is going to be uh, important. We, we need both of those in case there's other types of emergencies or uh, an earthquake that, that is gonna impede our ability to, to govern. I think the pandemic highlighted the need for broadband 
that we, we knew we needed for economic development, but it highlighted how much we needed also for education and healthcare uh, and the importance of childcare and, and how that affected not just families, but employers as families needed to be able to have a reliable childcare. We've been talking about this for a long time and we know that without having great childcare systems, we're not gonna have great economic recovery. And in preparing us for the next, um, the next whatever, um, we, we have strengthened our public health systems. We were working on that last in the last um, session as well. Uh, but we, I, I think dovetailing with the, building with the, the telehealth will, will help us a lot. We've been working on the Community and Economic Development Committee. I don't know the um, equivalent Senator in the, in the Senate, uh, but for resiliency planning, uh, making sure we're ready for earthquakes and other natural disasters. Um, Representative Lubbock had a, had a great bill to, to plan for future pandemics that didn't make it across the finish line, but we'll be bringing that back next year, I'm sure. Uh, and even bills to address like Senate Bill 5191, which helped prevent price gouging. You know, I'm old enough that my family and I uh, were uh, dealing with gas shortages in 9-11 and, and the price gouging is just unfair. And uh, it actually can, can contribute to shortages as people worry that, that they're gonna, uh, if they don't fill up, they're not, it's gonna be raised to $4 or $5 a gallon. So just some of the things I think that we did that, that are good, really a really solid foundation for the next emergency. Okay, thank you. Representative Gilday, priorities for addressing problems the uh, pandemic brought to light. Thank you, thank you. Um, so I'm not going to reiterate a lot of the things that uh, Rep. Paul and Senator Mazzal said. I, I agree with a lot of them. Uh, there was a lot of good stuff that happened in the legislature this, this uh, session to help address issues uh, brought to light by the pandemic. Um, and we're going to be talking about these for years to come. Uh, you know, Representative Paul brought up the uh, price gouging bill. Uh, you know, I think that uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, unintended consequences in that bill. Yes, I think price gouging is horrible, but it, it needs to allow for market fluctuation, uh, true market fluctuation. So there's a lot of things that we can do. Uh, and so there's a couple of things that I do want to say. First, I think we need to realize that, again, that this is going to be a conversation we're going to be having for years to come, because right now, Unfortunately, the pandemic has become so politicized that it's hard to have some of the conversations. And I think once we get a little bit further away from it, we'll be able to sit down and have more rational conversations about it. And, and I'm not trying to cast aspersions on either side, it, both are guilty of it. Uh, and then the second thing is that, um, you know, it, I think ongoing, I think one of the major things that we're gonna have to look at is the growing education gap. Uh, because school has been out for so long, uh, you know, I, I, I've had many conversations about my, my, you know, my wife's a teacher. I have two boys in middle school. Uh, am I worried about my boys? No, because uh, they have two parents who are very involved and have the ability and the time to put into making sure that they're not falling behind. Uh, my wife teaches up in Mount Vernon and uh, she's got some kids in her class that, you know, haven't, haven't been making it to school or are really struggling with the online uh, she is currently teaching the, the second grade class that is uh, that they have chosen to remain all online. Uh, and so, you know, but even when, uh, even before we went back to having some of the kids at school, I mean, just the, the education gap between the, the haves and the have nots, for lack of a better uh, term, uh, has been growing the last 15, 16 months. And so uh, we're really going to need to do that because that is going to follow those kids for years and years and years to come. And so something's going to have to be done about that. Okay, great. So um, the next question I think has been really covered by your comprehensive answers. So I think we're going to, we're going to skip one there. Uh, we're going to go back to start though with representative Paul. So the question is what steps can be taken to prevent or reduce the impact of climate change on our district? Thank you, Mayor. So I think, um, that's a great question. There are really two parts of that. First, we have to, in order to help prevent climate change, we've got to address uh, you know, carbon and uh, that we know scientifically that that's what's causing climate change. And so we've got a, our transportation sector is the single largest source in our state. 
Um, so I supported the clean fuel standards. And you, you know, when we do these things right, it actually leads to jobs, uh, especially in the 10th district where clean fuels can be produced and then used in our refineries uh, to help clean, create the cleanest fuel possible uh, for our cars and trucks. Um, and then we added an amendment. I added an amendment to that bill that also helps prevent um, safeguard against price spikes. Uh, we see so much of right now, we're seeing gas prices rise and nothing's been implemented. And so, so due to market forces, uh, you know, we've got to be able to, to respond quickly. And we think we've got that taken care of. We also passed an important bill that helps reduce greenhouse emissions in building construction. Um, and we did some good work on reducing uh, the impact of plastics and making sure that when we think we're recycling plastic, it's actually going to get recycled. Um, and then we got to address the, um, the impacts of climate change. And we had a really good vote, really good bill to help reduce uh, shoreline armory. That, that actually makes matters worse. People think they're protecting uh, their property. It actually can make matters worse. Uh, when you, soft armory works so much better. And we passed an important bill to help prevent uh, wildfires. Uh, by having better forest management. Uh, so I think it's, it's both. We want to help reduce the impact of carbon, and then we all want to be able to be prepared uh, for, for that impact. Okay, thank you. Representative Gilday. Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, so it's, I think what we need to really do is kind of step back and realize what we can do as a locality and as a state and I, I think what we should focus on most is having a coherent strategy throughout the state uh, because it, it's piecemealing it here and piecemealing it there doesn't do any good. We need to be able to implement programs. Uh, and there are some good programs out there. The, the forest health management, we do need to manage our forest a little bit better in order to uh, slow down wildfires. Um, but there's a lot of stuff that we do out there that we're not getting any measurable results from. And we should stop throwing a whole bunch of money at those types of programs. Uh, and and two that that went through the legislature this year, the low carbon fuel standard and the cap and tax bill. Uh, these are both very much regressive taxes. They're going to increase costs for everybody. Uh, and it's uh, uh, you know everything from the gas at the pump to the food and stuff you buy at the stores. Uh, and so you know those types of law don't do anything in order to help with uh, 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 climate change. They make less Washington less competitive. And, and when I say they don't do much to help climate change, it, they really don't. Because if, if you're gonna make it much, much more expensive for a business to operate here in Washington state, they're going to close up and move somewhere else. Uh, look at some of the refineries that are not building here, they're building in other states. Look at some of the, uh, of the aluminum industry. There are a lot of industries that are leaving Washington in order to go to more business friendly areas and so the pollution doesn't go away, it just goes somewhere else. And so it, it, that doesn't help global climate change. And so I think we need to really look at what we can have a measurable effect on and put our money to where we get the most environmental bang for the buck. All right, thank you. Senator Mazal. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so there are two things. One is carbon sequestration. Uh, the other is reducing the amount of carbon we're putting into the environment. Uh, I think that, uh, so for instance, uh, we've adopted no-till agriculture and uh, we can have converted a lot of former cropland to forage production for our livestock, uh, rotational grazing. Um, all of these uh, capture carbon in the soil. Uh, some of the practices we're using capture up 3,500 pounds of carbon per acre per year. Uh, timber industry, the uh, uh, yes, uh, we, we see them cut the forest, but at the same time they plant uh, this, the, these trees, which sequester carbon out of the atmosphere into the trees and into the ground. So a working forest is, is, a, is a matter of carbon sequestration. Uh, so in our district, yes, we can, we can sequester carbon, we can sequester more carbon, and the federal government is getting involved in that and looking at how to encourage uh, farmers and foresters to put more uh, into the ground. And we can look at, at other lands as well as far as their ability to sequester carbon. Um, I'm fearful 
of the low carbon fuel standards and the impacts that it is going to have on our economy. Uh, ethanol is made from corn, diesel, majority of it's made from soybeans. Uh, we're, we're seeing a rise in prices of commodities over the last few months that uh, only looks to continue. And when we reach a certain price, when corn hits seven bucks a bushel, soybeans are at $15 a bushel, um, it's, it's really not cost effective to make those into fuels. Uh, there are some other alternatives, most of which are not good. We don't have the technology yet. Uh, so I'm fearful that the low carbon fuel standard is really going to drive up the cost of living. And for those bottom third in our economy, they drive the less, least economical vehicles. They commute the furthest to work because they can't live there. This is just going to further erode their ability to compete in our economy. If we look at the figures over the last 20 years per capita, we're, we have continued to have less um, carbon that each of them, each of the constituents in the state of Washington is emitting. We're headed the right direction. Um, we just have to be careful that we don't change the entire economy um, to accomplish uh, a long-term goal and have a short-term unintended consequence that is going to be difficult to recover from. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, a couple more questions, and then we'll get to the Q&A that's coming in. So um, Representative Gilday, this one will start with you. What measures are being taken to address both short and long-term housing affordability and homeownership barriers? Thank you for that question. I'm just checking to make sure I'm off mute. Um, so yeah, we really do have a, a tight housing market, both for renters and for uh, homeowners. And one thing is not there's not gonna be one magic fix that fixes everything. Uh, just to give people an idea of how tight the, the housing market is, uh, when I first became a real estate broker, you know, Camino Island would, you know, they'd always have well over a hundred homes for sale at any given time. Uh, then about three or four years ago, I remember that it went into double digits, how many homes were available on Camino. And, uh, and, we were thinking, wow, this market is really tight, it's such a seller's market, you know, how are we going to get things to move? I looked earlier today and on Camino, there are 15 homes for sale. One of them is under 400,000. 10 of them are over a million. And so we can't expect, or people have a really hard time getting into home ownership. You know, and that's one way that you can build generational wealth is through property ownership. And when people can't even afford to grab onto that bottom rung of the ladder, it's really hard for them to pull themselves up and, and, to, uh, and to build that equity, to build that generational wealth. And so what, what we need to do is if you want to have more affordable housing, you got to make it more affordable to build. You just, you, you have to do that. Every time you raise or every time you implement new regulations, every time you change regulations, uh, put more burdens on the builders, then they're going to pass those costs on to the ultimate buyer, whether that person is a, a homeowner or whether that person is an investor who's going to be renting it out and getting higher renters. Uh, and so we need to control the cost of how much it costs to actually build a house. Uh, and second thing, as far as, as rentals go, uh, Senator Bazal brought up that we had a lot of contentious bills about landlord tenant laws this year. And, and he's right, we did. And uh, uh, over the last couple of sessions, there have been some very significant changes to the landlord tenant laws in the state of Washington. And you know, how I look at it is we need to remember that there are two parts to the landlord tenant arena. You know, there's the landlords and there's the tenants and they both have interest in there. We need to protect both of those interests. And so every time you raise the cost or the burdens on the landlords in a way to help out the tenant, it increases the cost to the landlords. And when you increase the cost, they're going to it, it increase the, the risk to them. And they're going to do one of two things, generally speaking. They're going to pass those costs on to the tenants in the form of higher rents, or they're going to give up, sell their units, and be done with landlording. And I'll tell you, when those rentals are sold, generally speaking, they are going to go to owner-occupied. That's going to reduce the supply of rental homes out there, increasing the rent for everybody else. And so we need to be really careful about that. Um, so one bill that I did uh, co-sponsor this year was 1157, and I'll just talk really quick because I know I'm probably going over my time. 
Uh, 1157, it didn't pass this year, but we're going to be pushing it again next year. And what it does is it creates a tax density zone where it gives incentives for local municipalities to create zones where they up zone and allow higher density. And uh, in exchange for that, they will get part of the state's portion of the REIT in perpetuity. And so that's a way that we can uh, incentivize, you know, use the carrot instead of the stick, uh, carrot instead of the stick. Uh, to incentivize the cities to increase the density and allow for more, more housing to be built. Great, thank you. You're okay on time. We appreciate those details. So, <laughs> All right, um, Senator Mazal, uh, next. Again, measures taken to address short and long-term housing affordability and home ownership barriers. So uh, Rep Gilde addressed the complicated issue that this is. Um, there have been some been some short-term solutions that were proposed, um, <clears throat> but this is complicated. And it's complicated, like I mentioned earlier, about commodities. Um, I've got a neighbor who is a home builder, and in a six-week period, his, his um, building package for his spec homes went up $30,000. We've seen the pandemic at first shut lumber mills down, and then everything took off. Uh, there were more housing starts in April in the state of Washington than in any month we've seen since 1978. Uh, so it isn't that we're not building the cost. We, we poured concrete today on the farm and uh, $105 a yard. Uh, part of that is supply, demand, a run up in prices. But part of that is the environmental regulations that the concrete companies have to live under. They're passing that cost on to us. When I started farming in the mid 80s, it was $43 a yard. So we've seen this increase in cost. And when I talked about some short term, there's been talk about changing the Growth Management Act. Oh, we just need to to put more available land on the market. Unfortunately, um, the cost of developing land is so high now that it rattles down to these individual lots, which you build a house on, that this, this cost is, is exceptionally high. So 1157, uh, Rep Gilde mentioned, was a really good bill because it helped municipalities change the zoning density so that they could accommodate a higher density. Um, we, we need to be looking really hard at that because that's how we're going to drive down the cost of ownership. We did pass some legislation when it came to condominiums and townhomes to make that more affordable because once again, that affects density in municipal areas that can handle the water and the sewer. Because honestly, we're reaching a point in time of saturation in a lot of these areas, whether it's on fives or two and a halves or tens, where we just, we can't build more out in the country, we're gonna to have to increase density in these municipal areas. And there was a, a number of, of bills that were proposed, most of them didn't pass, um, but hopefully next session, we can get some of those through to permit municipalities to be able to accommodate some of this demand for, for homes that, that we're seeing. Thank you. All right, Representative Paul. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so what a great question, what an important issue for our community um, and, and you, about our quality of life in our community. We know prosperous and thriving communities have to have housing that folks can afford to live in. And Senator Mizzou is exactly right. The commodity prices have gone uh, bananas. It's a highly technical legislative term. Um, they've gone crazy. And it, it, I think it speaks to going back to COVID response that um, you know, part of that is driven by the fact that mills and steel companies shut down production and, and, and then now folks are coming back. We wanna make sure that by having you know, good federal and state dollars to help people stay in business that we can actually keep those jobs because that's driven up commodity prices. And, and we know that it will eventually hurt our economy. If you're in um, South Woodby and you, you're a business and you're trying to hire people and they can't afford to live in your community, um, eventually that's going to hurt you and you're not going to be able to have the workforce you need. So it's part of our economic recovery. We've got to help. Uh, one of the things we did was in terms of renters, we in landlords, we passed some legislation that will help 
with that mediation and making sure that uh, we can get uh, both whole, uh, both renters and landlords whole. There was a, a good funding for the second um, session in a row for helping to fund the housing trust fund. That is really important um, for us to work with local officials like you, Mayor, and I see Commissioner St. Clair is on the, on the, is watching tonight, so that we can identify ways of having better mixed housing, more dense housing in our communities. Uh, we've got to work, continue to work to find ways to help uh, entry level workers and veterans and the missing middle be able to afford housing because it, Representative Gilda is exactly right. This is the way folks build wealth. Uh, and one of the things that I'm excited to continue to work on after talking and listening to Habitat for Humanity and other uh, nonprofit organizations is way, ways we might help support them. So oftentimes in our communities, it's that those small lots in our cities that are difficult to build in and it's not profitable, profitable for developers. Well, maybe we can work better to help policies that allow our nonprofits uh, to build there. That becomes a way to help promote a home ownership and also helps with that infill density within the communities. So thank you for asking that. All right, great, thank you. So let's see, uh, Representative Gilday, did I, I might've lost my track of this, I apologize. Um, yeah, I think I spoke on that one. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna move on to the last question before our uh, live Q&A. So let's see, we're gonna start with Senator Mazal on this. All right, um, given our region's dependence on ferries, what are your thoughts on the state of our ferry system? And do you have any goals for our ferry service down the road? Well, thank you, Mayor Boudreau. Uh, living on Whidbey Island, of course, we've got two ferry routes that, that service Whidbey Island. Uh, the, uh, let's take South Whidbey, uh, the Clinton uh, Mukilteo route. Um, it is one of the leading, uh, so there's two kinds of funding that goes into ferry system. There's the capital and the operating. So the operating is covered through the fees. Um, uh, the clinton Mukilteo route is one of the highest in the state as far as its ability to cover fees, uh, the fees covering the operating of, of that system. And we just finished the Mukilteo terminal. Uh, We've got, a, we've got an issue with costs when it comes to our state ferry system. Um, we, it, the state doesn't do anything cheaply. And there's a whole bunch of reasons why that I won't get into. But um, the reality is, is that it is not a cheap service that we've got um, in the way of ferries. Our Coopville Port Townsend route, um, that they looked at changing that. They've got to run small ferries there because of the, the harbor that they come into, Keystone for, for Coopville. So those are very unique. You get on the other ferry runs, they can interchange them, but the, the two that operate on that Keystone or Coopville uh, Port Townsend route are unique. Uh, Long term, uh, I don't see that we're going to be able to subsidize the cost of those um, super significantly. And we've had some bad luck. The, we repowered the Wenatchee, I believe it was, and then what turned into an engine fire. And theoretically, it was going to be up and going for our summer season. And that is not going to happen now. Uh, we are on a track, to, and, and Rep. Paul can address that since he's uh, much more involved than that than I am, but we are on a track to replace ferries. Uh, long term, Skagit County is putting in a ferry this year, or this next year. Uh, we just got some more funding for it. That is going to be an electric ferry that runs to Guimas Island. I think that there is some some future there, and that actually may drive down some of the costs that we see. Um, it isn't going to be available probably for every run, but there, there certainly are runs where it would work quite well. And the technology is changing rapidly. And so we're seeing that as an alternative. And that's going to be a good thing for all involved. But we're going to have to look long and hard at how we control the costs of our ferry system. Um, but as Rep. Paul mentioned earlier, it's, it's an integral part of our state highway system and uh, we're committed to making it work. Um, 
it just how do we keep those costs in line? Okay, uh, let's see. Representative Paul Ferries, thoughts on Ferries. Hey. Oh, thank you, Mayor. So, what a great question, and this is such an important issue um, economically for our district. Uh, so, from commuters getting to work, from tourists coming on the islands, um, really critical issue. And, and also, we have uh, manufacturers, uh, Nichols Brothers, and um, uh, in on Whidbey Island, and and other manufacturers and in Accordus that these are um, good paying family wage jobs, uh, that we wanna make sure that our local manufacturers are playing a part in, the, in rebuilding our ferry fleet. Uh, so we know, you know we went through a, a decade where no ferries were put into service. And one of the reasons I was so excited to partner with Senator Lovelett in Anacortes in the 40th district to, uh, to co-chair the ferry caucus was to make sure that the needs of of our community, our front and center as we're writing the transportation budgets in both in both the House and the Senate. And we, you know, folks outside of our district can get a lot of attention with big projects on the I-5 corridor and uh, the bridge that needs to be replaced down in Vancouver and Portland, but we've got to replace our ferries as well. And we know the, the, the fire on the Wenatchee that Senator Mizal mentioned, we know we don't have enough um, in case there's an emergency or, or there's a, a ferry gets a crab pot wrapped around its um, propeller. We've got to have some boats um, to spare and we're down to having nothing to spare. So we're working hard to try to also get in addition to the transportation budget in the state level to also make sure that our federal delegation is, is making, getting funds for us to help rebuild the ferries. And we know the hybrid electric ferries that are coming online, it's really exciting because that will save taxpayers money in the long run um, very quickly because of the maintenance costs are lower on those ferries. It produces less um, pollution. Um, again, it will save taxpayers money in the, long, in the long run. So that we're working to help build out that the, the ferry systems long range plan to make sure it's funded both with state dollars and, and federal dollars uh, and keeping at the forefront of the transportation budget riders. All right, Representative Gilday, Ferries, in your thoughts. Thank you very much. Um, so, you know, I think that uh, the Senator and Representative Paul said it, said it really well. Uh, we need to, we need more ferries. Uh, right now, we just, we simply don't have enough. So if one does go down, uh, we're, we're shorthanded and it just backs everything up. It is an integral part of our highway system. Uh, and, you know, after the 10 year lull of not buying any new boats, uh, we do have one in the budget this year. And, and uh, uh, I wanna give credit to, to, to Brett Paul for co-chairing the, the ferry committee because it is a largely bipartisan committee where we want to really improve our ferry system. And, and it includes uh, representatives from all over the Puget Sound uh, who want to uh, make sure that we have a robust and resilient system. And, and part of that is going to uh, be putting together a long range plan that we can take to the legislature in order to, uh, you know, this is, this is how many boats we're gonna buy. This is how we're gonna buy them. This is how we're gonna stagger them. Because if we can make commitments that we are going to buy so many boats, um, we can help drive those costs down. You know, if we're buying a one-off here and there, uh, those are going to be much more expensive than if we can say we're going to be buying 10 over the next 10 years. And I'm not saying that's the plan. I'm just saying, just for example, uh, it's uh, uh, something that we can help uh, use to drive down costs. So, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to working on it, looking forward to being part more part of the ferry committee. And uh, um, hopefully we'll be meeting more once we get down there and can actually meet in person. <laughs> Exactly. All right. Well, thank you all for those are the, the pre-submitted questions. So appreciate all the answers on that. So now I'm going to go to some questions that have come in live and maybe instead of the formality, I'll ask it and then just see who would like to go first. You can just jump right in. So the first question is from, I'm going to try and pronounce these correctly. So to the audience, I apologize if I get it wrong. Um, Darcy Monforte, I think, uh, she, she says, I'm immensely encouraged that our district represents both sides of the aisle 
because ultimately we are merely all citizens and neighbors rather than strictly Democrats and Republicans. What important bipartisan legislation would each of you like to see passed in the future? Thank you. So who'd like to take that one first? I'll talk since I'm off mute already. Great. Uh, first of all, I think it's really important to note that uh, Olympia is, and again, I'm a first session uh, representative, so I only have this this last five months of experience. But uh, from from what I have seen, we are not like DC, where everything is very partisan and everything is very uh, I, you know bitter and backbiting, uh, or at least that's how it appears. Uh, there's a lot of bipartisan work that goes on down there. Uh, there's a lot of you know the 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 two main bills that I signed onto this year, the the 1157, the housing density bill, um, that was with Rep. Burton. Uh, I blanked her payment, sorry, blanked on her name there for a second, uh, Democrat from the Olympia area. Uh, the, uh, uh, the other bill that I had had a, a Democrat co-sponsor as well. And so there's a lot of bipartisan work that goes there. I think going forward, what I look forward to working on in a bipartisan manner is, uh, is broadband. Um, I think that everyone realizes that broadband is something that we need to get out there, we need to work on, we need to get the infrastructure put out there. Uh, we had a couple of laws passed uh, this last session, and we have a lot of money put into broadband infrastructure. Uh, but again, it's not going to be just a one session and done type of thing. This is going to be an ongoing uh, project, and I look forward to working on that uh, with all members of the, of the House. Awesome. Let's see. Senator Paul? Go. <laughs> <laughs> Mayor, I'll go. Okay. So, uh, Darcy, thank you so much for the question, and, and I can't wait to see you um, uh, at the Island County Fair uh, like we ran into each other uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, so for me, the thing that gets me most excited is dual credit, which is opportunities for students to earn college credit while they're still in high school. Um, so that's running start in college and the high school and CTE dual credit. And then even some students are earning apprenticeship credit while they're still in high school. And that should be free for all students uh, that qualify for free and reduced lunch. So it should be free for all students, period. Uh, but let's start with the free and reduced lunch students. Uh, so you know, it's part of their K-12 education and part of their basic education. And I um, will be working very hard. Uh, I guess it's not going to be a secret since I'm saying in public. Uh, I'm going to work very hard so that students who qualify for free and reduced lunch shouldn't have to pay college and the high school tuition fees uh, or their textbooks for running start. And we want to, it's so important because 70% you know, of our students will eventually need some sort of post high school credential to get the family wage jobs that they're, they're going to need. And what a great way to start by getting them on that pathway while they're still in high school. So that's what I'm going to be working on. And it's such a great part, bipartisan issue because uh, Democrats and Republicans alike love dual credit and love our high school students. And we wanna make sure that we are able to get them on that pathway to, to something that's gonna help them get that great family wage job. So, yeah, thank you, Darcy. Um, the, uh, I, I don't think there's anything more bipartisanship than mental health and substance abuse. And uh, I signed on uh, with, members across the aisle on a number of bills this year. One of them was the making availability of Narcan uh, much more prevalent so that we have somebody in an overdose situation. It's readily available. Uh, this is a miracle drug. And, uh, and oftentimes those who have had it administered to them, that is their rock bottom. And they will then seek out the help that they need to uh, hopefully get beyond their addiction. Uh, so uh, that's the substance abuse side, mental health side. Um, Rep. Paul mentioned Ditch Wallach Center. The Swinomish Tribe has done an incredible job of putting together a, a very positive, successful program. 70% of it's currently non-tribal. As they expand, they're going to go to 500 and then hopefully long-term to 1,000 patients. Uh, we'll be treating uh, substance abuse um, throughout the, this corner of the state in a six, six county area and beyond. Um, there, 
I think that there is an area where we see a tremendous amount of bipartisanship. And honestly, um, quick anecdote, our new Lieutenant Governor is former Congressman Denny Heck. And at the end of the session, he, he said he took a, a moment, uh, personal privilege as we call it in the Senate, to uh, say that his, his faith in uh, legislation in politics has been renewed after sitting as the Lieutenant Governor of the Senate of the state of Washington. Because of the respect, the bipartisanship, the ability to disagree civilly uh, on matters and proceed forward, uh, he said the very things that didn't exist in Washington, D.C. We have rules on the, on the floor of the Senate and things we can and cannot say, and, uh, and we adhere to those rules and, and we treat each other. Doesn't mean we don't disagree. Doesn't mean at times we aren't passionate. But uh, when we walk off the floor, um, we know that we've done the, the right thing in representing the interests that are most important. And uh, so I, I think that we do. And, and, I'm, and I'm hoping that we can continue on in a bipartisanship manner in that. Thank you. Wow, I love those answers and that question was super. So thank you all for that. All right, next question is from Nigel Tabor Hamilton. Would, you, would someone tell us what the legislature actually did around telehealth? Thanks. Sure, I'll, I'll jump in, Mayor. So a, a couple of things. Um, so it's really, this is a great question. So one of the things that we had to do was um, fix the, the reimbursement rates for the Medicaid reimbursement rates so that telehealth would be paid at, at the same rate uh, or at a similar rate as if you have a doctor's office. And I think what is so, so the pandemic forced us to have to convert to telehealth or many of us to convert to telehealth. And, you know, we've learned that that actually is really helpful for many people. So there, when we hear folks talk about um, mental health, Senator just talked about mental health. I've heard from providers that say, you know, that first visit's important to have that face-to-face, -face, but sometimes with some of their clients, it's better to have a telehealth visit. They feel more comfortable in their own home than they do going to a clinic. Um, and then that, that doctor needs to be reimbursed uh, fairly. So it helps provide that parity, helps provide that access um, so that the, which benefits both the provider and I think, and the patient. Okay. Yeah, and I'll quickly address that. So I had a companion bill with Representative Riccelli from Spokane, who is uh, a Democrat, but we, uh, our legislation that went through both the House and the Senate, and honestly, I don't know if the governor signed it yet or not, addresses those very things. First off, the parameters around what is considered to be uh, appropriate, and then the ability to reimburse those providers so that uh, they can carry those on. And it includes a number of things, pre-existing relationship, uh, whether it's mental health or medical, uh, it, it included all of that in that legislation. All right, so the next question is from Wayne Flatten. I think I said that right. Um, what is your take on how homelessness is being handled in your district? Wow. Thank you, Wayne. Uh, you talk about setting us up. The, uh, this, is, this is something that there is a fair amount of disagreement on as far as homelessness. Um, I believe that the vast majority of homelessness is directly related to mental health and substance abuse. Um, certainly there are those out there who've ended up uh, homeless because of job loss or whatever the case is. Um, but in, in many cases, unless we treat the mental health of the substance abuse, and often they're intertwined, they're not going to be able to exist in a normal home crisis. I mean, home situation because of their crisis. Did Wallach addresses that uh, with both mental health, substance abuse, but also medical and dental and job training and societal training. Some of them have been out for so long that they they just, they've forgotten how to exist. I mean, all the way down to brushing their teeth and, and, and that kind of thing. Um, we're on our way. We're not 
we're not there. We, we, we need to do a much better job. And, uh, and it's going to, we've got groups that are doing an awesome job, just not enough of it in our district. And uh, it's, uh, it, it is a tricky situation too. I'm very well aware of several of them that are working through um, community issues because they want to cite a, a center in, um, in an area where the neighbors aren't happy about it. Um, so uh, it's, a, it's a tricky situation. And, and honestly, we don't all agree as to the solutions to it, but I think it has to be a comprehensive approach. I'll just jump in real quick too, that I, I agree that it comes down to a, a mental health and a, a substance abuse issue. So uh, the more we can support organizations like Digwalik and uh, uh, I know Marysville and Arlington have the Navigator program where they have a, a, a social worker go around with the cops to, uh, to, to speak with these people who are homeless and offer them the uh, uh, services. And then if they don't have the services then the cops there to back it up. Um, and I know that uh, Commissioner St. Clair is on here, and she is probably going to be uh, uh, not happy that I cannot remember the name of the program for Island County, because Island County has a wonderful program, too. And, uh, uh, and there, I believe it's an award-winning program that, that is comprehensive from uh, ride-alongs with, with the law enforcement officers to uh, providing the necessary help uh, once they are in custody, if that's the case. Uh, so a lot of it is, is gearing towards getting the uh, getting people to the help that they need and the services that they need. Um, so this year, you know, a couple of things that I'll point out that we did in the capital budget, uh, we provided over $200 million for a, uh, a new uh, behavioral health teaching hospital that's gonna be run by the UW. Um, it's important that we provide these services, but before we can provide the services, we need to actually have the service providers. And so the fact that we can uh, train more of these professionals here in this state it's going to help us in the long run. Uh, and, the, and the second thing that I'll point out is that in the uh, uh, bill that we passed in order to address the Blake decision, um, there was a significant amount of money put towards these types of programs, like the Navigator program and the program in Island County, where they, where they have the social worker out there in order to help direct people to the proper services so they can uh, improve their lives. So thank you, Mayor. So I so my seatmates are exactly right. When you talk to county officials and law enforcement, um, mental health and substance abuse are right up there with um, many of the top reasons. You also have folks that are escaping abusive relationships and we have community groups that are really working hard to help address that. Um, and then we've learned you know, the importance of trying to keep renters in their homes because once that spiral happens where they are homeless, it's, it's incredibly difficult to get back in a home. Uh, I'm really impressed. You, we just saw you on Friday um, at, at the crisis center in Burlington, which demonstrates the great work that can be done when our local officials and our state officials can work together. Um, and you and the other mayors and the county commissioners deserve a ton of credit. And then I think it's the job of the, the state level lawmakers to support that and just stay out of your way uh, when you're doing um, that great work. Um, so I, and I think finally, one of the things that can be happen at the state level is providing opportunities for coordination of services, um, working with, we know that our problems, community problems don't stop on a county line, uh, which is so important that Island County and Skagit County, Snohomish County are working together. Um, and if we can help facilitate that with our partners also in San Juan and Whatcom County, we'll do better in our community for our community. Okay, thank you. So next question, and it may be our last, depending on how long the answers go on this one. So it was an anonymous question about healthcare costs. Uh, what actions can be taken at the state level to remove cost barriers to receiving patient care and paying for prescriptions? Anyone want to start on that one? <laughs> so I'll jump in there. So we've done some work to help um, reduce the costs of prescription drugs. Um, and I'm not going to remember the bill this session, the number of this session. Last session, we also passed a bill. Uh, so this session, the bill helped 
facilitate for generic drugs. Last session, we helped reduce the cost of insulin. Um, it, whenever we can, making sure that we can get, you know, ge generic drugs is a great example of, of um, the same drug, but it's, it's a cheaper version uh, in the hands of folks. And then making sure that uh, in terms of lowering healthcare costs that folks have, the access to basic healthcare, because that, that preventative costs and keeping folks out of emergency rooms is so critical uh, for lowering the cost overall of healthcare. We know that the, those emergency room visits are, are so much more expensive and costly to ours, both individuals and our society. Uh, so that sort of preventative work that, that I think we help fund with the uh, public health dollars and also making sure that our primary care physicians have fair medic, Medicaid reimbursement rates, I think is really critical. So I, <clears throat> I uh, am the ranking member on health and long-term care in the, in the Senate. And uh, we are, uh, we're trying to determine exactly the answers to that question. Um, we're a little frustrated. Uh, we had a drug transparency uh, bill that we were supposed to have a report back to us over a year ago from the Department of Health that uh, we, we have not seen. They have not gotten that to us. We're trying to determine where are where where are these costs coming from? Um, are we do we have somebody who is profit, profiting um, substantially from from our health system? I can tell you that the majority of hospitals are not making so much money that they don't know what to do with it. Oftentimes they they struggle, and that's why we've seen some regionalization of some of these hospitals. Um, the direct providers, we're actually reaching a point in time where um, the doctors, uh, the, uh, the independent uh, medical practices uh, are, are dropping significantly. Uh, so uh, we don't have a really good uh, handle at this point in time on, on where these costs are coming from and how we now, like Paul, I voted for the insulin bill last year because I felt we had to do something, but we had hoped that the state would get back to us on that report and we would have some real good data to go off of, but we haven't. And we've written letters and, and we're indeed frustrated. I'm hoping that, uh, you know, our healthcare authority, uh, and now we have a new head of our Department of Health, that we're going to see a little bit better responsibility coming out of the state. Um, but uh, as a committee, we're, we're trying to determine what we can do to affect that. Uh, but in, uh, I, I'm not convinced that single payer healthcare is going to solve that problem. And, uh, but we've got to figure it out. And I'm hoping in the interim here to, to meet with some of the parties involved and see if we can come up with some solutions uh, to, to answer those, those very questions. Okay, so we've had lots of different topics tonight. And so I think we'll ask just for one final thought. I wanna uh, thank everyone for their engagement and feedback and advocacy. Sorry if we didn't get to all of the questions that were, um, were put up for this evening. But um, just to wrap us up for the end, could each of you tell us um, what you're thinking about for the interim and what you're thinking about for the next session? Um, I, I realize it might be really fast to ask you to start thinking about 2022, um, but but those final thoughts. So let's see. Yeah, Representative Gilday, do you want to do you want to start us off for that final thought? Okay. So for the uh, uh, the intern, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go on a bike ride uh, next week. Nice long bike ride. So um, that'll be a nice uh, some decompression there. Um, you know, going forward, I I do have some meetings set up. Uh, towards the end of the summer with some of the other representatives to look at some of the things that uh, we missed this year. Uh, one of them is the, the homestead exemption was increased and uh, your homestead exemption is now based on the average price of the county that you live in. Uh, personally, I think the homestead exemption did need to be raised because like we were discussing earlier tonight, uh, that's where a lot of people build their wealth. And so, you know, I think we should protect homes. Uh, but I don't think that uh, uh, a person in King County is worthy of more protection than somebody in Island County or Skagit County or even Snohomish County. 
I mean, the, and the differences are pretty stark. And so I think that's one of the things that I'll be working on. Um, some of the other things is uh, uh, continuing to work on housing issues. Uh, that bill 1157 with the, with the density zones, uh, I'd like to come up with more ways to, uh, again, use the carrot approach rather than the stick approach in order to entice and incentivize uh, cities and counties to uh, change their zoning to allow more dense building uh, because that's what we really need in order to uh, get out of this housing crisis. We need to have more housing. Uh, we need to give people that the ability to uh, get to uh, that first run of the, of the house home ownership ladder. And so those are a couple of the big topics that I'm going to be working on. Thank you. All right. Awesome. Let's see. Representative Paul. Thank you, Mayor. So, uh, so I'm going to be repeating myself. So I'll be working on the idea for helping to make sure that all uh, of students who qualify for free and reduced lunch uh, can take running start classes in college and the high school apprenticeship CTE classes for free and those costs associated with those classes. Um, we were really excited to get a budget proviso for Island County to help make sure that uh, Island County would have funding to help with youth and mental, uh, mental health for youth and, and students in our community. So we're gonna be working closely with uh, the county commissioners and their healthcare experts and pediatricians in our community to implement that well. We wanna to listen to the community and find out ideas for reaching students, reaching young people and getting them whatever sort of behavioral health they need. We know that this year has been incredibly uh, challenging for folks and we gotta um, help them uh, with, with, with meet them with the, where they're at and what their needs are. Um, so those are two of the big things I'm gonna be working on. And finally, working with Representative Binky of the Tri-Cities on his manufacturing bill to help make sure that we've got a diverse uh, manufacturing base throughout our state. I, I'm excited to see that bill implemented. I look forward to, to working with our local economic development councils and our local companies. They're doing, we've got companies doing really exciting work uh, with battery, battery manufacturing that's gonna be so critical as we move boats and ferries and cars to electric uh, right here in our district. Uh, it, so I'm excited to learn how we can help implement that bill and, and help make sure that our corner of the state has those good paying manufacturing jobs. All right, thank you. And Senator Mazal. So I will continue working forward when it comes to mental health and substance abuse. That has been a, a, a real passionate program for me. Um, but we also uh, just announced here two weeks ago a new Senate program, a Senate Republican program called Community Engagement and Inclusion. And uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to be head of that along with two other members from our leadership group who are, are looking forward and are working with minority groups throughout the state um, to address uh, what they feel were inequities, uh, specifically when it comes to state programs and how, how they're being uh, included in the state, whether it's contracting or business or, or even acknowledgement. Um, and so that's, that's going to be one of the things we're working forward with. We don't know that we're going to have legislation from that, but if we do, we'll, we'll be proceeding on that as well. The, uh, we're, as I mentioned, there will be a group that I'll be working with that are going to be looking at how do we address the continuing rise in cost of healthcare and what we can do to address that. And uh, some of that is government caused. And can, the, can, can our state government um, help to mediate those costs and, uh, and, and try, to, try to affect this increasing cost of health care that we're seeing? All right. Well, I just uh, want to thank all of you uh, for attending our town hall, those that are watching. Um, it's a great way that we can have many people participate um, and accessible to you wherever you are watching from your home or from your business. Um, I want a special thank you to our senator and our representatives and, of course, their staffs. 
uh, for being so accessible, not only for tonight and for your town halls that you've had, um, but throughout session. Um, it really has been heartening to know that you're listening to all of us. And so we really, really appreciate that. You have a really tough job and you've made us proud in the 10th legislative district. So thank you for that. Um, and so just for our audience, uh, know that we greatly appreciate the opportunity to engage with you and receive feedback to better serve the needs of the 10th district. So thank you so much, everyone, and have a wonderful night. Thank you so much, Mayor. Thank Welcome. you, everybody. Yes.